they are often very ideological, so it's different than the Commission. But even in the European Parliament, it's important to tell you that since probably people have the image that the European Parliament sometimes is quite anti-Israel, but things are changing and you just have to remember that last week the European Parliament ratified the ACA agreement, which is a very important agreement for commercial, for trade and economic relations between the European Union and Israel. On pharmaceutical. Yes. And it ratified with a, quite a big majority. So it's also, sometimes the perceptions do not meet reality. Reality is often different than perceptions. And it's important to emphasize this. Now, when it comes to the Commission, I don't want to enter in the competition between different institutions, which institution is more or less something. But the Commission normally, because of its functions, it has a less ideological approach to these issues, and it's much more pragmatic. <coughs> of course, from the Commission point of view, because it's not in the Commission competences to look at the conflict between Israel and Palestine, which is the, the issue that mo most divide Europeans, we look at other issues that, where cooperation is very important, issues like research, uh, scientific research, technological research. We look at energy issues, and now with the discovery of lots of gas around Israel, in the Israel, in the sea, in the territorial sea of Israel, it's a very important issue. We look at trade, we look at investment, we look at climate change, we look at agriculture. So there are many issues where there's huge room for cooperation between the European Union and Israel, and those are the issues that the Commission looks at. Now, but on the overall picture, I'd like also to emphasize, now more than the divisions between the institutions, that I believe that there is a game changer in Europe. We may be at a turning point when it comes to the image of Israel in Europe, uh, to a great extent thanks to what's happening in the region. And what's happening in the region during the last year made, I think, quite clear to many Europeans that the conflict between Israel and Palestine is not the central problem. You mean it would be an Israeli spring? Yes. Oh, I, don't call it, I don't call it the Arab Spring, I call it the Arab Awakening, Arab Revolutions, but I don't use the word spring because I don't think we can compare what's happening to what's happening in Europe. So I never use that word. I know that many people use, but I don't. Uh, but I think people are realizing in Europe that there are many problems in the region that have nothing to do with Israel and have nothing to do with the conflict between Israel and Palestine. There was this view in Europe uh, that uh, the conflict was the central problem. And once you solve the conflict, you would have peace in the Middle East. The Middle East would become a great progressive region. I think people have now realized that this view was not correct. There are huge problems in the region that have nothing to do with Israel. So I think this will be good for Israel because it will move the limelight away from Israel. And certainly all of the, these issues it's not an issue of Israel that the Egyptian people said to the world that Mubarak was the main problem. That the Libyan people told the world that, uh, that the, <coughs> their dictator was their main problem. It was, it was not Israel. Uh, if you ask the Syrian people, the main problem for them is not Israel. So this is, I, I think, a new development that will change perceptions in Europe. And because of this, people will also realize that probably should look at Israel beyond the conflict prism. There's much more about Israel than the conflict. You know, the ambassador just spoke about economic relations. Israel is a startup nation. We could have a coalition between Israel innovation and the European market. The European market is the biggest market in the world. It's just around the corner from Israel. You know, the, all these startups in Israel could benefit a lot from the European market. We have not only the biggest market, but the best rules, we have clear rules, we have transparency. It's not only the biggest market, but the, if you want, the best working market in the world. Uh, and we could, in Europe, benefit a lot from is Israel could be a kind of Silicon Valley for Europe, in terms of startup companies, in terms of technology. And sometimes it worries me if countries like China India we, and, and Russia will understand the potential of Israel before we do in Europe. And I would certainly like to see Israel much more involved in the European market than in the Chinese market or in the Indian market. 
So, so do we at Go for Europe. That's why I think your initiative is a very good one. Thank you very much. <coughs> uh, you are here re representing the uh, Israeli side. Uh, sometimes I have the impression that the Israeli government does not really care about world public opinion. Uh, I noticed that uh, the, embass the embassies of Israel usually uh, have very little communication budget. Uh, sometimes ambassadors are designated uh, who, do, who do not know the language of the country uh, where they are nominated, as if it was not so important and as if the policy of the Israeli government should be sufficient to convince world public opinion or that, uh, after all, uh, Israelis think that uh, they prefer to be blamed than to receive condolences. Can you comment on this? Um, Roger, I'm, although I'm not here to uh, defend the Israeli government, because as you mentioned, I no longer work for uh, that organization, I think you were a bit harsh uh, with your uh, judgment about it. It was, it was provocative. Okay, fine. It's perfectly fine with me. You'll see. Um, I think it's a bit harsh, and I uh, certainly think that uh, over the years, and you have to, uh, to look at a, uh, at a perspective, uh, there has been uh, improvement and there has been uh, a more professional approach to the whole uh, idea of um, Israel's communication um, efforts. But let me say this, I've, uh, I spent close to 30 years in the uh, Israeli diplomatic service. One way or another, I was involved in uh, communication efforts. It was a, a, quite a dominant part of my career. And the issue of uh, Israel's image overseas is probably the <coughs> oldest and uh, most uh, popular uh, quote-unquote topic that an Israeli diplomat has to deal with. Let me share with you one fact of life which I think uh, is important. The Arab-Israeli conflict is by miles the most covered international issue in human history, by miles. It has gained uh, that um, uh, honor, uh, first of all, by its uh, longevity, which is unfortunate, of course, but also uh, because there is a fascination uh, about what is happening in this region in general, in this country in particular. In all these 30 years, I have not found uh, a convincing answer to the question why there is such an obsessive interest in what is happening here. The best I can do is to tell you that probably none of us on this panel have the competence uh, to find or to seek an answer to that question. You would need a panel composed of a historian, of a theologian, of a sociologist, and most important, a psychiatrist. <laughs> With age, you stop fighting facts of life. And you think as of them as a given, something that is part of the realities that, uh, and challenges that you have to face. And once you do that, you can look at the question upside down. And that is what I uh, did certainly in Paris, but I started doing it before that too. And once you look at the question upside down, you look around you at other ambassadors of, or diplomats or representatives of countries more or less the size of Israel. Not the importance of Israel, of course, but the size of Israel. Uh, and you discover that they would give an arm and a leg to get one-tenth of the media attention that Israel gets. 
And sometimes they do give an arm and a leg, I mean. <laughs> they buy football clubs. They, they do all sorts of things which, unfortunately, since this country is n close to bankruptcy anyway, it's probably not realistic to buy a, a British football club or even Paris Saint-Germain. And then the question looks different because you already have the pipeline. You already have the access. So the trick is now to try and divert some of that attention to the things that really matter to you and the things that you would really like to show off about this country. So of course, you can't, as I often say, you can't hide the refugee camps behind the Bacheva Dance Company. It never works. But the refugee camps and what happens there and the rockets from Gaza and the, and the, the retaliation from Israel, all that gets covered anyway, if you like it or not. So what do you do in order to proactively get some attention <coughs> to the Israeli economy, to Israeli scientists, to Tel Aviv, as uh, Christophe mentioned, uh, to the startup nation, to Israeli culture, to cinema, to literature, to Nobel Prizes, to uh, tourism, you name it. And believe me, it can be done. And it has been done over the last years, and that is where I disagree with you that things are getting worse and worse. It may be true that we have not convinced the world about our position on the Arab-Israeli conflict and on the Palestinian issue in particular. I sometimes say that undoubtedly one of the best communicators ever living in this country who happens to currently also be the Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, who without any doubt has the skills and talents of, Israeli, of the international media. He knows them by heart. For decades, he's been trying to explain the rationale of Israeli presence in the West Bank and at the time in Gaza. And he did not convince them. So maybe that is not simply an issue of what we call Hasbara, which is a term so stupid that you can only understand the stupidity of it if you try to translate it into any other language. Just try it and you'll see. Not everything is a question of communication. And although I, I'm a believer in communication, there are issues of substance, of policy. And these decisions are not just made according to the question, how does it look to the outside? So what I'm saying is not that necessarily the prime minister should change the policies because it will look better uh, uh, to the outside world. Personally, I think he should change his policies for other reasons, but that has nothing to do with our, our discussion today. But what I'm saying, and I will conclude with that, is that there are ways, and especially in this kind of audience, I think people will understand that you can benefit from the obsessive interest of the world in what is happening in Israel. But, and there is a but, it's very difficult to do that. It's very difficult to use that pipeline, even 10% of it, for the things that we like to show off, as opposed to the things that we don't control and that we would rather uh, have uh, sweeped under the carpet. Although that never works. You know that even from home. Um, but you can try. <coughs> One of the prerequisites is to have a situation where you have convinced world opinion that you are devoted, even if you don't succeed, but you are devoted truly and motivated to resolve the conflict with the Palestinians. The wonderful thing that happened to me as an ambassador in Paris during the first two years and which enabled me and my colleagues at the embassy to promote Israeli cinema and science in the, in the French media and startups, etc., etc., was the fact that there was a peace process that was active. 